Welcome back. Believe it or not, we're just about ready to deploy our Curve Funder contract. But first, let's make sure we get through unit tests okay. The good news, as you can see in the bottom right-hand side of the screen, is that unit tests are passing. Fortunately, this is a fairly simple contract, so there's not a ton to test. Basically, we just care if it works correctly and if the money tallies properly. So we're not even going to look at the test factory and test funder methods. They're checked in the repository. You can go ahead and check that out. Make sure that you understand that. Feel free to post any questions in the comments. The user checkpoint one is a bit more confusing. So we're going to walk this through this one in a bit more detail. The first few lines are just our imports, and we're creating some constants to handle week and year. Um, skipping the coverage test means that if we're running our coverage tests, which are a bit slower and they probe into all the different nooks and crannies of the contract, we're going to just say it's irrelevant. We're not going to bother with this one. By line nine is where the first test begins. And this is where we want to actually make sure that the contract is emitting the amount of curve that we're expecting it to. So for some review, we created some fixtures last time. Basically, we're deploying the entire curve setup to a local development network. Alice is going to be our guinea pig user. The gauge controller is a super important contract within Curve. It manages how all the different Curve pools receive rewards, it essentially knits them all together. You can see it in action here. This is everyone voting on this week's gauge weights. Every week, Curve users vote for which gauges should receive the most Curve funds, and then they get streamed accordingly. So in this case, Frax is going to receive a very heavy gauge weight of 17% in the upcoming cycle. Here you can see the actual contract itself. You can see there's 118 total gauges, and this is deployed at uh, the address listed here, OX2F5. One of the properties of this is that there's different types of gauges, and because we're working on a local development environment, this gauge controller is empty. So we create a test gauge type, and then we're adding our gauge to this gauge controller. Here's the funding contract. It's receiving the gauge type of zero, which is the one we create right here. And 10 to the 18th is the starting gauge weight. So there's a number to deal with. Following this, we're gonna pull some parameters we're interested in. The inflation rate of curve is the amount of curve that the token mints in any given basis. This decreases periodically. So we're pulling the current rate so we can make sure that the math lines up. For the future epoch time, essentially our curve token is also empty. So we're gonna be creating a new epoch of inflation and writing its parameters. Finally, the total emissions is what we're gonna increment and tally as we go through subsequent weeks. Next up for our funder gauge contract, we want to get a time of the last checkpoint, which is basically because it's a new contract going to be when the funder was deployed. The way that these rewards gauges work is essentially when you call this user checkpoint, called here two lines later after we mine for two years, it's going to basically write into the funder contract a point in time and a timestamp, and it's gonna calculate how many rewards the particular user, in this case, Alice has accrued at that time. Then when you call it again, it looks for the next checkpoint time, subtracts from the first checkpoint time and runs the calculations between these intervals. Next up, line 21, we start running our massive loop. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep going one week at a time, we're gonna calculate the emissions and we are going to then keep incrementing weeks until we eventually break, which is when the week time is the exact same as the transaction timestamp. So in this case, we are defining the week time to be the previous time, week time plus one week. And then to round things out, we do an integer division by week and then multiply again by week. This knocks out the decimals and gets us to a single, single week. It's either that or the transaction timestamp for the most recent transaction. And if we hit this, then we know that the loop should end. Next up, we're pulling the gauge controller's relative weight at this point. This is the result of the voting as we've seen. For this test, there should probably not be too much interesting going on because we don't have a ton of other gauges. Next, we're making sure that the 
future epoch time, which was what we called up here, when the next epoch time for curve inflation hits, then the inflation rate changes. And if this is the case that this epoch time falls in the middle of the week, then we're going to have to have a bit more complex logic. Otherwise, line 33, the total emissions that we get for the week is simply the, this formula. Gauge weight times rate times the week time minus previous week time. In other words, how many weeks are we handling between the uh, two and divided by 10 to the 18th. The more complex logic means we have to break this into two batches. So in this case, this is where the curve inflation hits and the inflation rate for the first half of the week is a little bit different from the inflation in the second half of the week. So for the first half of the week, the total emissions is that formula. Then we change the rate. We take the previous rate and we divide by this number. It looks like it's kind of a magic number, but all this is is two to the one fourth power times 10 to the 18th. It's the rate reduction coefficient. Every epoch, when curve inflation reduces, it reduces by this parameter. And at this point, the future epoch time is now said, this is gonna be now one year in the future. The curve epochs occur every August. So this is saying the inflation has happened, emissions are less, the next epoch time will be one year from now, next August. And now we continue cycling through this continually until we hit the aforementioned condition when this transaction timestamp is the same as the current week. Then we break. Other than that, we are going to set the previous week time as the week time and run the cycle again. And at the end of this test, we test to see are the total emissions that we're expecting this number here, which is what we'd expect if we're simulating it, is it actually the same as if we integrate this fraction for the entire period that we're running this for Alice? And if so, the test passed, which, spoiler alert, it did. We then repeat very similar logic for the other test here, in which we're checking to see if the cap, all these curve funder contracts have an immediate cap. And when that happens, we're checking that the gauge is killed. So we run basically the same logic and we just add these lines here, line 76 through 80, which is if the emissions are above the max emissions, then we essentially stop. Otherwise, we keep going. And we assert that the total emissions was in fact equal to the max emissions. We want every last single way of curve to end up in the pockets of the recipient. And finally, when this hits and when we call the final call, we want to make sure that the funder is killed. So this is a much more complex test. Curve uses a lot of complex math. You don't necessarily need to know all of this. The important thing is that we simulate through the entire thing and the results in the simulation, which is essentially the entirety of this test, match up with the a results we're expecting. Curve funder is going to now, in theory, work. We'll find out in practice as gauges apply in real life and see if they receive funding.